Please take your Bibles and turn over to the book of Revelation. Tonight we continue our study of that book. We had a, a great time last week as we were uh, looking at the introduction to the book of Revelation. And tonight we want to look at an overview so that we'll have the structure of the book of Revelation. In Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 8. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John, who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. Blessed is he that readeth and will hear the word of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is, and which was, and which is to come, and from the seven spirits which are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him be all and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kingdoms of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is, and which was, and which is to come, the Almighty. Amen. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for our Lord Jesus Christ and how we thank you for how he is revealed in this book. It is not the revelation of St. John the Divine. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It says so in the opening verse. This is an unveiling, a shining forth of Christ in his magnificence and glory, not merely in his mercy and love and grace, which he showed at his first coming, but now his omnipotence, now his righteousness, now his justice, now his judgment. Father, we pray that you might bless our hearts, not only with a deeper understanding so that we might have insights, but with a compassion for those who are lost who will suffer the things that are written in this book if they do not repent and turn to Christ. And so, Father, we commit this to you and pray for your blessings upon this time that we have together, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. You recall that we covered a number of very basic things in our uh, introduction to prophecy because this book does not stand by itself as the only prophecy in Scripture. This is the culmination of all other prophecies in the Bible. That means it's the culmination of approximately one-third of the Old Testament. So every prophecy of the Old Testament that relates to the second coming of Christ is summarized and completed in the book of Revelation. Every prophecy that our Lord Jesus Christ gave in the Gospels while he was here on earth is summarized and completed in the book of Revelation. Every prophecy that the Apostle Paul spoke of, and there is much new prophecy, as I told you last week, there are 17 different mysteries that are listed in the New Testament, and Paul defines for us what a mystery is, something that is not revealed in the Old Testament unto the prophets, but is now revealed to the apostles and prophets by the Spirit of God. New revelation in the New Testament concerning things to come. 
And so, as we look at the book of Revelation, we need a very broad sweep of all of prophetic history through the Old Testament, both the things that built up to the first coming of Christ, over 300 prophecies fulfilled in Christ's first coming, but more prophecies than that that relate to his second coming are found in the Old Testament. Some of the future prophecies are not found in the Old Testament. For example, the rapture of the church, because we do not see in the Old Testament anything except that which relates to Israel. And the church is a composite body made up of both Jews and Gentiles. The church is one of the mysteries. It was not revealed in the Old Testament. Israel is not the church. The church is not Israel. We have new revelation concerning the church when we get into the New Testament. And we must always keep that distinction in mind when we are looking at Old Testament prophecy. Old Testament prophecy takes you almost instantaneously from the death of Christ to the second coming of Christ. And we find a lot about that as we go a little further. So the first thing is to see how much of the Old Testament is in the prophetic material about the second coming. Second thing is to realize that the New Testament not only restates and clarifies Old Testament prophecies related to the return of Christ, but gives us that new information, which we talked about a moment ago, which is the things that are called mysteries. If you understand the 17 mysteries, and those of you who've been with us for a while know that several years ago I covered all 17 of the mysteries, and you should have written them down. I hope you did. By the way, if you are taking notes, and I hope you are, tonight would be a very good time to take notes, because when I move into the new material tonight, I'm going to give you a very structured outline of the book of Revelation. And if you have that down, you'll be able to follow precisely, exactly, where we're moving step by step through that book and through the Old Testament prophecies that foreshadow what the book of Revelation is talking about. So I hope you have a paper and a pencil or a pen to take those notes tonight. Thirdly, we need to understand that all the symbols used in the book of Revelation are used elsewhere in Scripture. So to correctly interpret the symbols of Revelation, we need to look at other prophetic passages where the symbols are used and where they are explained and defined. They are actually defined. We don't have to guess. Fourth, one of the basic hermeneutical principles of the Bible, exposition is to take the actual events literally over uh, even though symbolic language is used. The book of Revelation is a very literal book. It uses symbols, but it's talking about real events that are going to take place on earth. Fifth, you cannot understand New Testament prophecy without first having a good grasp of Old Testament prophecy describing the same subject. Six, it's important to understand that Israel and the church are not referring to the same group of people, and we discussed that in some detail last week. Seventh, we will not be able to cover all the Old Testament prophecies related to the return of Christ, which, as I said, falls into two parts. There is the rapture, which is not revealed in the Old Testament. That's where we go up. There is the second coming. That is where we come down. And we come with Christ, who touches down on earth and defeats the Antichrist and his forces and throws Satan into the bottomless pit for a thousand years. And he throws the man of sin, the Antichrist, and the false prophet into the lake of fire. We'll get to that a little bit later. But that is distinct. The second coming is distinct from the rapture. Rapture means to be caught up, to be snatched up. People say, oh, the word rapture doesn't occur there, but the Greek word does, harpazo, which is translated into English, to be caught up. That's the word meaning the rapture. And we'll talk about that when we get to it. Now, last week, I handed out a list of prophecies. Daniel 7 and 8. Psalm chapter 2. Do any of those sound familiar to you? I hope they do. I read those two to you. Psalm 110. Ezekiel 38 and 39, which describes the rebirth of Israel as a nation and the battle of Gog and Magog, the first battle. Zechariah 14, which describes what happens when Christ lands on the Mount of Olives and splits it and enters into Jerusalem at the second coming. Joel 2, which discusses the day of the Lord in judgment. That's a very important thing to understand. In fact, 
John mentions it here in the opening verses of the book of Revelation. We'll see that when we get to it. But the day of the Lord is prophesied in Joel 2. We saw Matthew 24 and 25 was one of the passages I gave you. That's the Olivet Discourse. I listed for you Jeremiah 30, verses 10 through 24, a judgment that deals with how the Gentiles treat the Jews, and that is the same judgment that Jesus talks about at the end of Matthew chapter 24. And then Isaiah 65 and 66, which describes the millennial reign of Messiah. Now, I knew, I suspect, you know that I'm going to ask you a question. What is the question I'm going to ask you? How many of you did your homework and read all those passages? May I see your hands? Whoa, everybody but one. Oh, my. That's very important to read those passages because you need to understand those passages. Now, I know that's why a lot of people went on vacation this week. They didn't want to be here tonight when they heard me ask that question. And we got a whole bunch of people scattered out there who, if they're listening in, are wiping their foreheads and saying, oh, man, I got away with it. No, you didn't get away with it. Because I'll ask that question again next week. <laughs> but it's not just because it was a homework assignment I gave you. It is the Word of God. And if you want to understand Revelation, although I think some of you think, oh, I already know everything about Revelation, let me clue you in, you don't. In fact, one person mentioned to me last week, they said, oh, we're going on vacation. If that means that we're going to have to we're going to have to read all those passages during vacation. My response, what is more important, having fun or reading God's word? What are you telling me about your spiritual life? You know, when you're here and at work, you could say, well, I have to work all day, so that takes up too much time to actually get through all those. But when you're on vacation, what else do you have to do? And do you have no hunger and thirst for the Word of God? Or are you a mechanical munchkin who says, well, I read 10 verses per day, and that's all I read, and if it's not in those books, I'm not going to read it. You will stand before God someday and give an account for what you don't know because you didn't read those chapters. I'm saying that to a broader audience than this, of course, to those out there who may be listening in. To understand prophecy, you must study prophecy. It's not simple, it's not easy, but it is fact. And it will happen precisely like God said it would happen. And if you understand it, you will have a deep desire to see others come to Christ. Prophecy is a great motivator for witnessing. It gives you a passion for witnessing. Back in the 60s, yes, I was alive back in the 60s. In fact, I was getting old back in the 60s. There was a lot of prophetic interest. And you know what? There was also a lot of evangelism. And there was a real concern in the church about people who were lost. Don't expect always to be spoon-fed with pablum. You have to do some study yourself. I'm trying to make it as easy as possible, but if you really want to understand the meat of the word, you can't be drinking milk all the time. When people complain that my sermons are too hard and I know that I have tempered them down, it tells me that I have some baby Christians who do not study the word of God like they should. Strong meat belongs to them who are of full age. So if you think it's too hard, it is God who said it, not I. Strong meat belongs to them who are of full age. Okay, enough meddling. We talked about 
The different positions, or the main systems anyway, of eschatology, premillennialism, premillennialism, I'll say it correctly, Christ comes back before the millennium, and that has those who believe in pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib, but that's all before the millennium. You have amillennialism, which is no millennium at all. Uh, they don't believe in a thousand-year reign of Christ. They just think that the thousand, where it talks about a thousand years, just means a very long period of time. That does a great disservice to the Word of God, of course. Now, they think that we're living in the millennium right now. Well, if this is the millennium, it sure doesn't look as good as the Bible portrays it, and that means that we're going to have a pretty disappointed time when we get to heaven, because it may not be as good as the Bible portrays it either if the millennium is like what we're living in right now. Post-millennialism that says Christ will come back at the end of the millennium after things get better and better and we bring in the kingdom. There is a lot of that going on today, especially in the political realm, where people are trying to Christianize the world because they think that's the only way that they'll be able to bring Jesus back. And then there's preterism, which has become very popular today, where they believe that all prophecies concerning the second coming were fulfilled in 70 AD when Rome sacked Jerusalem. Of course, I went over various charts, which I passed out last week, and we won't go over those again. So tonight, we move into a new section, a new segment of our study, which is an overview of the book of Revelation. Now, before we begin, I told you last week that I wanted to share with you some things that are happening right now, things that are very, very interesting to be happening in this year, in 2017. In fact, a number of believers have come to the conclusion that these are the signs that foreshadow the coming of Christ, because Jesus talked about this in Matthew 24, verses 29 through 30. In Mark, I hope you're taking some notes as to where these are located, because I'm not going to read those passages to you tonight. Matthew 24, 29 and 30, that's only two verses, you can read those. Mark 13, 24 through 26, three more verses. Luke 21, verses 25 through 28. And we'll be getting to this one, Revelation 6, verses 12 through 17. When you look at those and you compare what's happening in the world around us, people are saying, wow, it looks like the Lord is going to be coming back instantaneously. Now, um, I have a good friend who is a pastor in Israel. And I got an email from him a couple of days ago where he talks about things that he has been studying and discovered some very interesting things that happened in 2017. Anniversaries of things. Of course, all of you know that coming up we have a, just a few days here, we're going to have a total solar eclipse across a path of the United States and a lot of people are driving south uh, down to see that. It's going to pass, I think, a total eclipse is going to actually touch parts of 18 states uh, as it comes swinging across. We'll have a partial eclipse here, but uh, it'll be a total eclipse in those areas, and I was reading on the website, <clears throat> the uh, United States government actually has a, a website up, <coughs> excuse me, about the upcoming eclipse, and, uh, you know, giving hints as to how to avoid damage to your eyes. I got another uh, one from our, the insurance company that insures the church here, saying if people are coming from the general public and plan to use your parking lot to watch the eclipse, uh, here are some tips that you better be sure that you take place. Of course, we're not in that total eclipse belt, so it probably won't happen here. But um, that's a big sign in the heavens that people are pointing to, because this only happens very, very rarely. A total solar eclipse. That's one thing here in 2017. But let me read to you what he wrote. This is my friend Howard Bass. He was Philemon's pastor in Israel down in Beersheba when Philemon was there in medical school. This is his words. This year of 2017 is a year of convergence, commemorating a number of significant events in history, all connected in some way with the Lord's providential supervision of history in connection with the spread of the gospel and the salvation of his people Israel, and judgments and the blessings to come for the whole world through his two-edged sword. 2017, 500 years since the Reformation. 2017, 120 years since the first Zionist Congress. 
2017, 100 years, that's a double jubilee, since the Beersheba charge, 100 years since the Balfour Declaration, 2017, 100 years from the capture of Jerusalem by Gentile Christians, 70 years since the UN Partition Plan, 50 years jubilee since the capture of Jerusalem by Israeli Jews, 300 years since the beginning of the first Palestinian Intifada, that means to break the yoke, or the horse shakes off his rider. A lot of things. 2017 is a marking point for a number of rather important things that relate to Israel. Scoffers may think, this is back to Howard, scoffers may think that there is nothing going on which speaks of the Lord's return, but God is giving people in many walks of life to consider that there are countless ways pointing to the end times of the last days. In nature, in morality, and of course we know that from what Paul says in Romans chapter 1, in return of the Jewish people back to the covenant land of promise, signs point to and signify something to draw the attention and direct us in the right direction. In other words, signs are not important in themselves. A sign just tells you whether you're supposed to stop, whether you're supposed to turn right because you're in that lane. Uh, you know, there are signs that tell you things. They're not important in and of themselves other than giving direction. The gospel accounts are a bit sketchy. When the Magi from the east saw and understood the celestial sign connected with the birth of the king of the Jews. The Holy Spirit is waking up the church, but there is much confusion of faces, to use a phrase found in the book of Daniel. If you had read those passages, you would have read about the confusion of faces among the unbelievers and among the believers. And the world is unable to give us much credibility since there is so much abuse and misappropriation of signs. My prayer is that the Lord will do what he needs to to bring his sheep together with one accord and one voice. In love and unity, all is a testimony to the truth of who Yeshua, Jesus, really is. I pray that he would put his fear into his own and into the world at large and grant repentance where it is needed, most in each of us who call on his name out of a pure heart. May the voice of the Lord be heard, his words spoken, and heard in those with ears to hear. Amen. 2017. Perhaps Christ will come this year. We don't know. The coming of the Lord draweth nigh. We know that. But of the day and the hour knoweth no man, no, not the Son, but only the Father in heaven. But we can see the stage being set. The things that you see going on around you, even the rally that was out on the street outside this building a little earlier this evening, are telling you you're living in the end days. Every man that has the hope in him, the blessed hope, looking forward to the imminent return of Christ, every man that hath this hope in him, what does John say? Purifieth himself even as he is pure. Prophecy is a motivation for holy living. Now let's look at the book of Revelation. It has a very unique structure. There are a number of books in the Bible that are like this, where you can write down big capital letters, like if it's from your side, you're going to start up here with a big A, and then slightly indented, a big B, and then a little more slightly indented, a C. So just write those down with some space. A big A, capital A, then slightly indent, capital B, slightly indent, capital C. And I'll tell you what to do next after we have covered those first three, because the first two are very simple. And we're going to discover at the end of the book of Revelation, it goes from, it went A, B, C, then it goes back C, B, A. You have a perfect balance. The book of Revelation is very clearly designed by God to give us a perfect balance. And you will see that as we get into the part C in just a moment. So part A, under that big letter A, write the word, or next to it, write the word introduction, dash chapter one. Next to so the big letter A, 
Introduction, Chapter 1. That's what gives us a very interesting breakdown that we'll see as we get into Chapter 1. Then you've got the big letter B, slightly indented. Write, the people on the sin-cursed earth. The people on the sin-cursed earth. That's chapters 2 and 3. Then you have indented a little bit more, capital letter C. That's the key events of things to come. The key events of things to come. And that's chapters 4 through 20. Then down just a little ways below that, in the center of your page, write seven sets, seven sets, dash, heaven and earth. I think you're going to find this part very fascinating. Seven sets, dash, heaven and earth. Set number one, you can write that off to the left a little bit, set number one. We see something in heaven, and then we see something on earth. In fact, each set gives us something in heaven and something on earth. Seven sets of in heaven and on earth. Set number one is in heaven on earth. Set number two, in heaven on earth. Set number three, in heaven on earth. Set number four, in heaven on earth. Seven of them, that's the number of completion, of perfection. So under set one, in heaven, that's chapters four and five. Set number one in heaven, chapters four and five. And put in parenthesis next to that, the throne room vision, comma, the book, comma, and the lamb. Chapter four and five shows us something in heaven going on. Three things, the throne room vision, the book, and the lamb. Secondly, under set number one, on earth. Now we're going to see something that takes place on earth. That's chapter 6, verse 1, through chapter 7, verse 8. Chapter 6, verse 1, through chapter 7, verse 8. What's happening on earth? Those verses cover the first six seals and the 144,000. That's what's going on on earth. The first six seals and the 144,000. That brings us to set number two. Set number two. We see something going on in heaven, and then we see something going on on earth. In heaven, chapter 7, verse 9, through chapter 8, verse 6. Chapter 7, verse 9, through chapter 8, verse 6. And that, you can put in parenthesis next to that, is the great multitude and the seventh seal. The great multitude and the seventh seal. The first six seals are broken open on earth, but that's not what we find when we get to the seventh seal. That's part of the in heaven part. And then in set two, the second thing is on earth. That's chapter 8, verse 7 through chapter 11, verse 14. It is on earth. And in parenthesis next to that, right, the six trumpets. The six trumpets. That brings us to set number three. Under that we see in heaven and on earth. In heaven, chapter 11, verses 15 through 19. And here, just like with the seals, we see the seventh one in heaven, here the seventh trumpet in heaven. And then down on earth, that's chapter 11, verse 19, the second half of the verse, we see the earthquake and other horrible events. The earthquake and other horrible events. 
Then we move down to set number four. In set number four, we see first in heaven. That's chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. In heaven, chapter 12, verses 1 through 12. And that is where we see the woman with the child and the dragon. That's in heaven. The woman with the child and the dragon. Then we see on earth. That's chapter 12, verse 13, through chapter 13, verse 18. Chapter 12, verse 13, through chapter 13, verse 18. We find the dragon and the two beasts. The dragon and the two beasts. That's on earth in set four. Then we come to set five. First, we see in heaven. That's chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. Chapter 14, verses 1 through 5. And then in parenthesis, that's the Lamb and the 144,000. We've seen the 144,000 on earth back in chapter 6 and 7. Now we see the Lamb and the 144,000 in heaven. Then we see in set 5, on earth. That's chapter 14, verses 6 through 20. Chapter 14, verses 6 through 20. We find the six angels. There are six angels in heaven. Excuse me, on earth. Six angels on earth. In chapter 14, verses 6 through 20. Then we find some different angels when we move to set 6. In heaven, chapter 15, verses 1 through 8. And here we see the seven vile or bowl angels. V-I-A-L, not V-I-L-E. The seven vile or seven bowl angels, chapter 15, 1 through 8. That's in heaven. Then we find what takes place on earth. That's chapter 16 verse 1 through chapter 18 verse 24 and that's the pouring out of the seven vials on earth or the seven bowls on earth I hope you notice something very little was given in relation to the the seals very little was given in relation to the trumpets but now we're having a huge amount of space being given to the bowl judgments. They are the most ferocious and most violent of all the judgments. They take place in the shortest period of time, and yet they are given the greatest amount of space in the text. The bowl judgments occur in a period of about one week. The other judgments, when you have the seal judgments, that takes you through the first three and a half years. When you have the trumpet judgments, that takes you through the second three and a half years. But when you get to the bowl judgments, you've got all seven of them being poured out in a space, and we'll talk about how we know this when we get there to chapter 16. You have all the bowl judgments being poured out in a space of about a week, and yet you have the most amount of revelation about the bowl judgments. Keep that in mind as we move through the book. And so we see the seven vials in chapter 16, verses 1 through 18.24. That brings us to set number 7 in heaven. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. Chapter 19, verses 1 through 16. This is a beautiful scene in heaven. The wedding supper of the Lamb. The wedding supper of the Lamb. And then we see what's taking place down on earth. Chapter 19, verses 17 through 20. The final five judgments. Chapter 19, verse 17 through 20. Now that was C. You had seven sets under number C. You remember where we started? 
We had an A, which was an introduction. We had a B, which is people on the sin cursed earth. We had, chapter, we had number C, which is the events of things, or the key events in the things to come, chapters 4 through 20. So we went A, B, C. And under C, there were seven different sets. Now, back under where you put your first B, down here at the very bottom, put the people on the new earth. Remember, B above was the people on the cursed earth. Now we have B, as we're coming to the conclusion of this book, the people on the new earth. That's chapter 21, verse 1, through chapter 22, verse 5. And then, just like you had an introduction in chapter 1, you can put now the A there for conclusion. So it goes A, B, C, B, A. You see the balance as it comes down in this direction, runs straight down, then comes back, so that the introduction parallels the conclusion. That A at the end is chapters 22, verses 6 through 21, and as we'll see, it parallels precisely with what we found in the introduction. Now that is your general overview of Revelation, and I hope you read through the book as we are preaching these series. It will give you an understanding of where we're going. Now the second thing that we need to understand as we look at the book of Revelation, it is the exact opposite end of the book of Genesis. We have God creating the heavens and the earth in the book of Genesis. And it is perfect. Then we have the entrance of sin into the world. And man has the fall. The book of Genesis begins with, in the beginning, God. The last verse of Genesis chapter 50 ends, speaking of Joseph, in a coffin in Egypt. You start with creation and life, you end the book of Genesis with death. We find at the beginning of Revelation, the people on the sin cursed earth. But when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, we find the tree of life, which was mentioned in Genesis. And the angel barred the way to the tree of life because of man's sin. But we have the restoration, judgment on sin, but we find the new heavens and the new earth. God created the first heavens and the first earth perfect, beautiful. Sin came in and destroyed it. When we get to the book of Revelation, Jesus says, Behold, I make all things new. There is a complete arch from beginning to end and a restoration from eternity past to eternity future. The structure in the Bible is not accidental. It is part of divine inspiration. It's part of what God is trying to communicate to us because he is Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the Genesis and the Revelation. And that's why he's presented that way in the opening chapters of the book of Revelation. That gives you an overview of the book. We only have two minutes, so I'm not going to try to go in deeper. But that gives you a structure whereby you can compare the first book of the Bible to the last book of the Bible, whereby you can see the opening introduction, the people on the sin-cursed earth, which takes you back to Genesis and the sin-cursed earth. It takes you through the judgments that are going to fall because of the sin of the earth. Then it brings you back to a restoration and people on the new heavens and new earth and a conclusion that parallels the introduction where we enter into the eternal state where there will dwell no more sin, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more pain, and no more death. God is the one who outlined those books. 
and the books in between. Oh, I wish we had time to do outlines like this on every book, but did you know there is structural outline to every book of the Bible? Even the book of Proverbs, even the book of Ecclesiastes, which people seem to have a hard time figuring an outline. Even First John, and I've read commentators who say, well, the, you know, it just wanders all over the place. It it's, it's, doesn't have any structure or outline to it. That's nonsense. It has very definitive structure. Every book of the Bible is that way. And if you study them carefully, it will come to you, it will pop out at you. You'll suddenly realize the balances as you move through those books. But that's our time for tonight. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that as we have looked at an overview of the book of Revelation tonight, that you will help us to use that in our personal study, and that you will help us to compare Scripture with Scripture. Paul said of the Bereans, these were more noble than those of Thessalonica, in that they searched the scriptures daily whether those things were so. They had a hunger and a thirst for the word of God, proving that they were saved people. If we have no hunger and thirst, perhaps it's because we're dead. Because dead men don't want to eat. Dead men don't want to drink. Dead men have no interest or excitement about the things of the spiritual world, but only things of the carnal world, the things that are going to be fun for them, the things that they can be spoon-fed so that they'll learn a few things, a little tidbit here and a little tidbit there so that they can show it off sometime and, you know, make other people think they really know the Bible. Father, cause us to love the Word of God. Cause it to be central to our thinking every day and in every way. You have given in the book of Revelation various signs to know that Christ is returning. Jesus gave those same things in Matthew 24 and 25. Old Testament prophecies talked about the second coming. They talked about the tribulation. They didn't talk about the church, but they talked about all these things that we're looking at in the book of Revelation. The warning has been given, even as it was given to Pharaoh. He had plenty of opportunity. The Lord is long suffering to us, word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. The Lord was long suffering in the days of Noah. 120 years, the world saw him building a boat. And they mocked and they jeered and they laughed and they scoffed. Paul tells us that that's what God does. He's long-suffering with the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. But someday God closes the door. Someday the final call will come. Someday the church will be out of here. The rapture will occur and all those people who said, Oh, well, I'll believe it if I see all the Christians gone. They will not believe because the Bible says so. The Satan will send them strong delusion, delusion so that they will believe the lie. Who received not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Help us to compassionately tell the lost when we witness to them. No, if I'm gone, you will not believe. Now is the day of salvation. Today's the day of salvation. It's the appointed time. This is the time that God has given you. He is being long-suffering right now to you. Will you trust Jesus? Father, again, we thank you for your word and its power. Please use it in our lives to form our minds and conform our minds to the way that you think so that we will understand the scripture that you have revealed. For we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.